I'm Brian Greenberg. I'm at the Silicon Schools Fund. Um, you have a great panel today, so I'm not going to waste any time. You have your app. You can look at their bios. We're going to jump right in. Um, they asked us to make this fast, punchy, and yet go for depth. And the last time I got that challenge on a panel, I was at South by Southwest, and Anthony Kim and I ended up doing shots on stage together. <laughs> but since this is Salt Lake City, we'll do intellectual shots today rather than alcohol shots. Um, we're going to start by everybody just gets 30 to 45 seconds to tell you a little bit about what makes their school interesting. The beautiful thing about this panel is these are people running real schools with very different models. So I'll go first, how we see the world and what makes you interesting. Silicon Schools Fund, we're a foundation, we're in the Bay Area. We have funded most of the new cutting edge sort of blended or personalized schools that are out there. We invest school by school. So we raise money from high net worth people. We pull it in a fund. We do venture philanthropy. We've helped start 24 schools and convert seven schools over the last five years. And we're about to launch our next fund to go for 40 schools in the next five years. The theory is really to make a regional innovation hub in one setting where people can learn from each other and push. I'm Denise Gallucci. I'm thrilled to be here with you all. I represent GEMS Education. We are the largest private provider of private schools, K-12 schools worldwide. We have 250,000 students across 20 countries. What is special about us is we have schools from $250 per pupil per annum in India to schools to $45 and $50,000 all over the world. Our goal is to find every child in every corner of the world and transform their life through education. I'm Allison Cleveland. I'm from K-12. Uh, we provide online education solutions. Uh, I believe we're the largest online provider of managed public schools. We have over 100,000 students enrolled in public schools across the United States. And what we're really trying to do is bring a world-class education to any child, no matter where they live, be it urban setting, rural setting, but um, you know, every AP class you can imagine, every foreign language you can imagine, introducing career pathways to kids who, in many cases, can't afford a private school and don't have access to a public school in their area. That's great. My, my name is uh, Dominic Lichty. I'm from Mountain View in California. I'm running uh, the Con Lab School, which is associated with the, with the Con Academy. Uh, our graduate profile is about personalized learning around the content with providing the students goal time, self-directed learning. Uh, we're disconnecting the grade levels from, from the academics and we have project-based learning. And our vision is really developing global learning experiences and making them accessible to the world. I'm Colleen Broderick. I'm with Alt School. Um, Alt School is really kind of two things. One, we are a set of micro schools that serve as a network in which we are working to cultivate very different learning environments in a personalized learning space. And additionally, we are a technology company that works hand in hand with our lab schools to develop the tools that make sense for teachers to develop and scale personalization. Next year, we'll launch with our first set of partners. So we are looking to um, broaden our network, not through our own micro schools, but through the partnerships that we develop with other schools. So my guess is everyone in this room is sort of one or all four of these entities. We have a really great crew. Um, a lot of people want to talk about scale. I actually prefer to start talking about like the innovation because it's not that interesting to scale something that's the same as it's always been done. So if you were sitting with your college roommate and they said, I don't get it, like what, what's different about what you're doing? What's one tangible thing that when you walk into your school captures why your school looks a little bit different than the schools that we probably went to? Anyone can jump. I mean, I think ours is the most obvious because by and large, <laughs> our kids are actually not going to a brick and mortar school. So what looks different to us is our kids are largely working from a home-based setting, some blended centers here and there. Um, but what we're trying to do is meet the need of those kids. Um, they wouldn't be coming to us if where they were currently sitting had been working for them by and large. So why are they coming to us? Learn why that family made that decision and meet their needs. And it's everything from advanced learners who aren't getting enough from their traditional school to struggling learners to kids on the autism spectrum who really struggle with learning in a social setting. So we are working one by one to figure out what does that child need and how do we make that child successful. So I think at GEMS, we, I'll choose one school, our school in Chicago. It's a world academy. It's networked with uh, seven other world academies in different countries around the world. Our students spend four days in the school and one day in the field. The classroom collaborative groups that they have are not the four students or five students sitting at their table. 
but a student in Dubai, one in France, one in Singapore. And beginning in first, second grade, students are learning how to operate in the cloud, how to navigate time zones, getting up at six o'clock in the morning in the second grade to ensure that all students are on their video conference. And so it's certainly providing a truly global perspective from our earliest learners. For us, this is all about student agency. Um, as I said beforehand, they're working on goal time, self-directed learning. Um, our kids in elementary, about 25% of the time, they're uh, working with the tech tools on their content. Uh, in middle school, it's about 35% of the time. And now we're opening high school, it's starting at 40% of the time. And the second part is really the independence. Um, as I said, we're disconnecting grade levels from um, the academics, and we call this independence level. So our independence level are uh, focusing on self-management, time management, collaboration focus, motivation. So that's how we're um, classifying the different levels from level one to level six at, at the moment. Dominic, before we keep going, I want to, can you drill down on this? Because I've been in this school, I've seen this. Um, content is separated from the group you're yep. learning the content in. Correct. You can be, uh, if you ask a kid in this school what grade are you in, they look at you because they don't know what you're in. So yeah, how old are you? Okay, so you're a nine-year-old. You can be sitting next to a 12-year-old. You might be working on the same content. Tell them about how you determine independence levels and why that matters to you so much. Yeah, so we have a second grader who is working on a sixth grade math curriculum at the moment. But he still is immature, so he's an independence level two, right? So, and he needs more kind of support and guidance uh, during the week, so, but his math ability, his cognitive skills is so uh, advanced and accelerated, so and that's the reason why we disconnect these two things. We have even a fifth grader who works on, on trigonometry right now, so he joins the middle school or high school classes in, in math, but in his independence, he still needs support, somebody needs to check in on his kind of goals per week. What were you thinking when you said this in that? Yeah, I think um, it's kind of like a yes and, um, because really, I think you'll step into our environment and see aspects of everything that everyone's talking about. What really differentiates us and what we're trying to accomplish is how do we empower more models? We're not looking to replicate our own, but how do we ensure other models have exactly the right data that they need to support kids and what their needs and what they're ready for. So I would say in terms of innovation, it really is how do we dig deeply into understanding assessment flow? How do we understand clearly where students may be in relation to their goals and how to connect those in very vibrant and real ways to the right content? Ensure that they're linked up appropriately to different mentors, to different organizations, so that their learning holds relevant and, and is contextualized. I mean, you all are thinking about trying to reach every school in the world in some ways. Like, that really is in all of your missions. And yet, you've all decided that at some point you had to have a real school of your own. You had to either have one or four or ten mm -hmm. or you know, hundreds of your own. Tell me about that starting with your own pilot so you could tinker inside the kitchen. And at what point did it start to be like, now we're just another district running. I know you're still one school, you have many. I'd be curious to hear that question of how many schools and what does it feel like early in piloting versus once you become a district trying to manage lots of things. I'd love to take that because I think, of course you get the economies of scale and the efficiencies when you're large, but we continue to think small. So while we have 250,000 students, each of our schools is a separate unit that's part of a whole. And I think the only way you can remain innovative and nimble is to think of, of, of a school of one. Uh, even a classroom is, a, is, is, you have 20 students in a classroom, should be 20 classrooms of one. And I think if you scale that way, thinking of the individual, then that's the way that you can continue to stay on the leading edge. So when I started in the charter movement, that was the vision. And really quickly we were running like just five schools and suddenly we're like, well, we can't have five <laughs> different schedules. You can't. How have you kept that or where do you say, okay guys, you don't get to innovate as much as you want there. We have to do something centrally. So I started a system of magnet schools yep. um, in Connecticut the same exact way a classroom schools of one into a district of two dozen schools of, of one. And I think that if you hire right, which we know is the most difficult challenge, then you hire the right people, you have a core set of values that everybody buys into. Everybody 
buys into the framework, and then you continue to push the envelope. And one school reaching a new height pushes the other 10 or 50. And I think you have to continue to push people to think outside. And the problem with our education system as I see it today is the district, the management of schools. And we're not about managing, we're about leading. And we want to build leaders. And in order to do so, you, you have to think small, but allow, think big in a small way. A allow folks to, to continue to innovate. So that's really appealing to me. The flip side to the autonomy coin is how do you do quality control? Mm -hmm. What do you guys do when you're like, oh, we don't like how that school is looking? Where do you, how do you deal with that? Is it just a hiring? No, no. Actually, there are systems of, of control as in any business. Yeah. So we have teams of individuals that, so there's a, a, a curriculum group that's centralized and a quality assurance group and folks are tied into what's happening and everybody submits their strategic plan. So in a typical business, you submit your business plan, you have metrics, you have KPIs. We run in the same manner. It's the intersection between business and education and we teach our leaders to run their schools in the same way to ensure that they also have quality control metrics locally. I would say we've taken more of a standardized approach than it sounds like that you have. I think in the early days when we were pilot, we really had this idea of let every school, you know, it was brand new. Nobody had heard of full-time online schools 15 years ago. So it was a little bit of, okay, well, we've got one in this state, we've got one in that state. Let's hire a good head of school and sort of provide the curriculum, provide the technology and kind of see how they bloom. And, uh, you know, eight years in, what had happened was we had you know, I don't remember at the time if it was 50 or 60 different schools, but they were all doing things in different ways. And then it became very hard to build any one tool that would meet more than two schools' needs. And so, for example, they were coming to our team, you know, centrally saying, we need a better grade book, we need a better grade book. Um, the one we have doesn't work very well, it doesn't integrate, blah, 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 you know. And so we started, okay, we build a lot of stuff. We're kind of a build versus buy analysis, doing that all the time. Is there something out there we could just integrate in? Should we build it from scratch? Okay, well, what do you need in a grade book? And we went school to school, and every school was grading entirely different. So there was no way I was ever going to build a grade book tool that would meet more than two schools' needs. Everybody was going to be unhappy. And so I think at that point, we really started to undertake an effort to say, okay, what are the essentials that have to be the same for our model to work and to feel like we're a, a quality uh, you know, management organization? And then where do schools get to iterate? And that's been a big adjustment, I think, for heads of schools that really largely were kind of running their own, they, they were CEOs of their own school, their own company, um, and now kind of pulling back and saying, okay, well, good instruction is good instruction. So really, you know, the way we use data to drive instruction, that should look the same school from school. We haven't really found examples of that looking very different when you study high performing mm -hmm. schools. Um, grade book, we need one tool that works for most of you, right? So where is the freedom? It's really in the leadership and the culture you create at the school. But we've spent a lot of time thinking about what are those things we do need to standardize that need to be the same across our now, you know, 60-something schools? And where do schools get the freedom to iterate? And where do you, you know, where when you start to see somebody go off the rails do you have to pull back? And what, how, how are you measuring that quality to make sure the freedom that you've given them you're monitoring and you can pull back if yeah. you need to? So if I could just add to that, if you think about our world academies that are in seven different countries around the world, you walk into a world academy in Chicago, a world academy in Dubai, you can tell that it's a gem school. You can see all of the touch points. You know where you are. Um, our, we have metric ways in which our teachers collaborate, our coordinators collaborate, and our heads collaborate. So all around the world, we're studying the same units of inquiry. They're international baccalaureate schools. So to the, to the essentials of what makes a good school relative to looking at data and data driving instruction and assessment for learning, those to me are very typical things that, similar to what you said, have to be in place. But what book studies you do, how you lesson study, the way in which, what speakers you bring to the school, the, the kinds of STEM strands that you use, those to me, I think you, you need to push your thinking and allow some creativity. Mm -hmm. right. But I think we're, we operate in different contexts. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, go Dominic. Ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, this is why I shouldn't be on panels, because sometimes I just can't keep my mouth shut. Um, but, but I really respect the approach, but it will take us generations to mm -hmm. get there. 
if we're thinking about how do we create systems for leadership, how do we create systems for professional development, that we've seen over time how much change management takes. And so there has to be something that switches the conversation. And for Alt School, the reason we went with micro schools is we wanted to be first outside of the system. Absolutely agree, like the district institution is really sometimes paralyzing in, in terms of innovation. So we wanted to be in a space where we work outside of some of those regulations, even though we are certainly using tools that kind of show where our students are in terms of standardized metrics. But we wanted to be in a place where we could try something differently, see what teachers were doing without imposing something first. And going ahead and surfacing what are those things that serve as the greatest levers. And then how do we use technology to signal those? How do we use technology to ensure that we organize for those so that we can accelerate what it can look like in the learning environment. If we continue to think about thinking outside the K-12 box as schools, we will not get very far. We need to begin to think about how do we get beyond schools to really learner-centric environments? How do we coordinate a system around a learner, whether it's beginning with agency levels, whether it's starting with rich mm -hmm. curriculum, whether it's creating this space for really deep connections across a community? Until we start investigating how do we empower those things, then we're not gonna step outside of the box. Right. So you guys have been doing this for a few years, Colleen. What have you found to be big levers within old school that do unlock something different? Yeah. Or even one. I would say probably one of the greatest things that has helped us understand um, how to really shift the culture of learning is having a portfolio of data. And that sounds like, of course, you need to have a portfolio of data. But what does that look like when you combine online tools? What does that look like when you combine teacher-generated assessments? What does that look like when you combine um, captures of emergent moments of learning alongside anecdotal evidence of really broadening the story of what learning is and being able to organize that in ways to respond. It pushes the confines of what you need to consider to support that learner. I would like to add in terms of quality insurance, one piece or another level that we haven't discussed yet. You know, um, in, in, in our vision, one of the A's that we have in is, is art of teaching. And, and these days we're forgetting the teachers and we're all about kind of the teachers because th their role is changing in our model but also student role is changing from being a consumer to be a more creator in, in our systems, right? And before we started, we, we were thinking about scale two, oh, let's open some school, let's standardize like the whole thing. And, but then we paddled back a little bit. And then we said, no, let's focus first on teacher training center because I cannot build any more airplanes without having my crew, my pilots in those airplanes. So, so our next step is before, probably before we even scale further in, in terms of like public school district, charter schools, et cetera, we're gonna start first with the teacher training center because then the teachers can come to our school, see it in action, may take one or two elements, maybe the one-on-one, -on -one, what they're doing with the students back home to their schools and can improve on really on a small scale something where we can infuse uh, innovation. Talking about um, the big le the, the lever for change, we feel that given our reach across 20 countries and, and growing every day, we have a unique opportunity to, to do something special. And GEMS has been in existence for near, nearly 60 years, continue, continuing to innovate and iterate and perfect what it is that we're doing. So what we've decided now, we've hired teams of people from some of the smartest people from your organizations here <laughs> too, to um, take what, what we've developed and push it out internationally on the, on the end of a mobile phone free to every child in the world. And so we're calling it Equaled Education, providing STEM education online to, to every child in the world, free on the end of a mobile phone. And we, to your point, believe that the bricks and mortar will always be, there will be a place for it, but mm -hmm. learning will happen everywhere and, and learning will be ubiquitous. And right. how is it that we empower individuals, not only students, but teachers and adults to take control? I think micro-credentialing and showing what you know is going to continue to evolve. Um, something we've not talked about on this panel yet is building good people. 
And school is about that. The, the school, whatever it is for you, is about creating citizens, global citizens, that recognize their responsibility in the world and how they can make it better. And I don't know that technology can do that just yet. Yeah. It's interesting. When we first started in the charter sector 15 years ago, everybody would pitch, this is how many schools I'm going to open serving this many kids. Mm -hmm. And I would say at least half the pitches I hear are, oh, we're going to open just a handful of schools, but then everyone's going to replicate what we're doing. And of course, the issue there is like it's really hard. It right? is hard. Yeah. So you guys have all either currently partnering, planning on partnering, you know, currently in lots of different schools, trying to give away on the end of a mobile phone to everybody. What makes you think this time it'll be different? The work that you all do in your micro schools or your pilot settings <laughs> will be replicable and won't just be eaten up by the entity called schools. And there are more of us doing it. That's true. And I think the the passion behind what works. And I think there's a space now. There's, there's space in the market for, we have created a buzz where I think families now recognize that we as the educators are accountable to them. And technology has disrupted so many industries and we just continue to kind of trug along because school is school. And so families will push us. And I think 10 years ago, this panel wouldn't be here and this conference wasn't here. So the fact that we're coming together, we're talking, we're collaborating, will only make us better. And we're on the journey. We're not there yet. Yeah, it's interesting to hear the different perspectives because you know I am largely a district, right? I mean, that is how public schools get funded. You have to work within the system. While we do have the flexibility to give kids different curriculum levels, mm -hmm. the state and the feds do require you to say what grade a student is in, and that's going to determine what test that kid takes at the end of the year for state accountability. Um, and I think it's, you know, for the foreseeable future, it's, it's refreshing to hear visions of how we, you know, how we become more student-centered, but largely, too, for the next at least, you know, five, ten years, we have hundreds of thousands of, of 12th graders we're graduating every year from public schools who really don't know what they're doing next. Um, Maybe they actually can read and write at a graduate level, and maybe they can, and what are the solutions for them? And so I think it's got to be working from both ends of the spectrum, but the vast majority of kids in our country are going through a public school system right now and need to be prepared for what comes next, and don't have five years to wait for what that what the next vision of evolution of a school is. They are in schools right now, too, so I think we've got to think about it in both ways, be visionary, but realize that we are serving kids today who are going to graduate in the next three weeks and, and hopefully have a plan, whether it's straight to the workforce or to college, that's going to allow them to be a productive uh, uh, member of our society. There's a very sobering statistic from the U.S. labor statistics that says 65 percent of, uh, of, of grade school students, elementary school students, will populate jobs that have yet to be created. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the current model, how do we then prepare those right. students? And that, that to me is, is a very scary thought. So when you operate at both ends, you have to meet somewhere in the middle to ensure that students can think and adapt and be resilient, the, the skills that we need to teach today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to jump in on, on Allison's point quickly. This is a call for the need of parallel paths, right? This is a call for ensuring that we continue to make improvements within our current system, but that we need to populate a parallel path as richly and as deeply so that we are continuing to look for solutions. We are continuing to think differently about how to serve kids in the future. And absolutely, they'll converge at some point. But if we are limited by thinking about how do we change the current system, we know we can't disrupt ourselves. We know there needs to be a space where we're trying and doing different things that can inform what's happening within the current system. So I, I appreciate the point. I think it's important to call out. And we need to ensure that we're building an incredible depth on the other side of it as well. Colleen, you made a, a pitch earlier for like think outside of even what we call school right now. Mm -hmm. um, and you can think about virtual reality, augmented reality. You think about all the things that are happening in tech. Dream big. What could this look like? If we assume brick and mortar won't always be the mm -hmm. dominant force, or even right. let's say there's a physical place we send kids for the custodial reasons exactly. we have schools. 
what could be happening inside our schools? When you dream about what your kids might someday do if they worked in education, what's on your mind? I, you know, having kids myself that are grade school, you know, it was just a few years ago we were putting the first one in kindergarten and, and they go to a great public school, but it felt a little bit like I am sticking my child on the great assembly line of yeah. US education and I will get them back in 13 years and pray that they have a plan. You know, it just felt like, you know, you drop them off in the morning and you pick them up in the afternoon and you largely don't know what happens during the day. And, you know, through K-12, I, I get to see the vision and, and, and albeit it may be still somewhat of a traditional vision, right? Because they are, they're in a school, it may be a virtual school, but the vision of, of um, schools that look entirely different, how are we developing humans? I mean, sort of to your point, yeah. global citizens. And, and for a lot of our kids, it's, the emphasis isn't necessarily on global, they're in rural communities, but they are getting involved in their communities. Mm -hmm. They're no Service. longer tied down by the nine to three traditional schedule. They're getting to participate in you know, apprenticeship programs. You know, one school we have in Wisconsin that does career tech, part, we've partnered with the local operator engineering local union. They're getting to learn how to operate big machines, but they can do their math a little bit in the morning and a little bit at night, and their day is free to go have hands-on experiences that mm -hmm. are preparing them for the future. Or kids who just have a heart for volunteering and have a mission and want to serve you know, kids who are underprivileged, and now they have hours of their day that they're organizing clothes drives and food drives. And it's just, it's neat to see how much more there is out there than drop your kid off at nine and pick them up right. at three. Right. But it's funny, it's great that you're saying that because it really ties into our kind of vision what we have for our high school. We actually would like to design it as a co-working space, right? So because then th we don't know if a high school needs to go still to college or can do just that degree on the job, right? We don't know how that job market will change over time. So we need to provide already this structure like in high school so that they know once they're getting into the job market earlier, they know how to deal with that, right? So, and we're thinking about with the independence, with this kind of ownership time that we're calling during, during this high school time. So say 40% on their own, but the rest, as you said, internship, apprenticeships. Our students were just uh, a couple of weeks ago, they were, we were partnered with IndieBio in, in, in San Francisco. This is a biotech accelerator. Our students were for two weeks at that in the biotech accelerator and were working in their real science lab outside of school, right? And they and, and at home they could work online on, on their content based on that. So I think that will change within the high school, but also maybe it will drop into kind of middle school. Elementary still stays, uh, I think, guarded and protected because there's still a lot of guidance what those students need. They don't know what they don't know, right? But I think in high school it will really go towards this, this co-working space where students can just come in, pitch its project, um, and, and gets collaboration amongst the other students who are there, and the content is going to be online. We are predicting now that our students are going to be done with content in 10th grade. So that's what we're predicting right now. Um, we have enough data to predict that already. So what we do, 11th, 12th grade, there's no stress on SATs and APs and all that, uh, the whole curriculum what they need for transitioning out. So we need that time for something else, real life experiences, and I think that's what is important. Yeah, I think what I would add to that is, you know, the, the question becomes, how do you hold people accountable <laughs> to this? And I've been thinking a lot about, it's about accountability, but it's also about responsibility. And, and coming back to how do we ensure that um, learners are cultivated as citizens and global citizens. And so what's their responsibility? So, so ultimately, we can bundle together all these different opportunities, but to what end? And to support students in finding not just passion, but purpose. You know, I, I envision something like social impact scores for students as becoming a mechanism for responsibility. We have a third grader in one of our schools right now that created what she calls the birthday box. And oh. <laughs> the birthday box literally was built for um, homeless children oh. and that they get a birthday party in a box um, because she recognized who's going to give them a party. Mm -hmm. and, and seeing that there are entries for young people across the world to contribute. Um, and what could that look like in the future, I think, can serve education well to solve. You know, it's funny, at an innovation conference, you rarely think about accountability as the main driver. <laughs> but especially in K-12 education, yeah. you know, California has this system where you have to complete 10 courses in high school. Literally, yeah. you need to do four English, three yeah. math. It's called the A through G. If you don't do it, you can't go to a UC or a Cal State yeah. school. So you basically can't go to college, right? So you say to someone, dream big, but make sure you do all <laughs> exactly. these things. Yes. And then the SAT shows up, and it says, be wildly creative, but mm -hmm. get a high SAT score. 
how willing are you in your schools to slay those sacred cows and take risks with real kids who are trying to get into college for this ideal versus mm, we're still kind of playing it safe and ink tinkering on the edges? So I think for that, um, and this is when I was in a, a public school system, now I'm in a private system, good teaching gets you there. Mm -hmm. And ensuring that there's a, a comprehensive sequence and you understand what's required. And if you provide students with the opportunities to think, to it, it, it's about the transference of knowledge, not, not the not the AP test. I mean, an AP is going away little by little. The SAT is trying to reinvent themselves. The College Board is looking at who are we and how do we get to that next level to, to continue to stay relevant. So I think your, your innovative question, what is school going to look like, I think grades will go away. I think seat time will go away. I think it will be a mastery system. I think we'll look more at what individual students need to know and be able to do for the trajectory that they're on. Will we see it in our, chi in our children's education? I think so. I think it's happening now. And when we have conversations like this, we force that conversation. So I do think that we, we need to move beyond the SAT. There are so many schools who aren't even looking at it anymore. So grade so, level goes away, grades go away. <laughs> what time frame? 5, 10, 20, 40. How many years? I wish I could predict that because I'd, <laughs> I'd probably a lot, be a lot more successful than I am today. Um, I think in the next 10 years, we will, we will see some big changes. What are your thoughts? What, what does it turn into and oh, how, what's the time frame? We, we don't have grades anymore already, yeah. and it works perfectly. So it's like there's no stigma on this grade levels. What is an A? What is a B? It's like now they get qualitative narrative feedback mm -hmm. back. So can I read your narrative? So it's not just, oh, what do you have a B? And yeah. then they run away from each other, right? So there's actually a dialogue happening after they get back an assessment. But I, I think what we need to focus on is content, context, and concepts, right? They're applying their content in different contexts, and they're, they're connecting into larger concepts, like um, we call it macro concepts, such as like relationship, identity. Um, I think that's way more important that they see those relationships amongst these this, this different concepts. Uh, before moving on, we are thinking also now doing portfolio to make it way more authentic the entire transcript, right? Just these numbers makes no meaning for us at all, right? So we're taking all the numbers out and we're creating a portfolio where they're adding their authentic, say, YouTube videos, their project, everything what they have experienced, their reflection on the concepts that they're into that portfolio, and that's, that's what they take then to the college, and that's how we're gonna challenge the college admissions part as well in that regard. But I think it's really about authenticity here. It's not about kind of like the data thing, what is important anymore. Yeah, I, I think that the trouble is, you know, in the public school, school sector, mm. yeah. you have to do that. Yeah. You know, so you say, to what, it, what extent are we willing to slay the dragon? Well, we need to keep, we want to keep our schools open, and to keep them open in several of our states, your kids have to take the SAT. Um, and if they don't, don't score a certain score on average, your accountability is, is damaged in the state. So, you know, trying to play within the current system, you're forced to check all the boxes of what the public school system is telling you you have to do, your authorizers, your state and federal governments. Um, so we're doing a lot to have the privilege of even operating. Um, would love to also then, and we do also try to focus on the things that we think are more important, but what you get is, this endless list of all the things that you know, you've got to yeah. do the things, you've got to check the box on to keep your school open while we're trying to innovate and really provide mm -hmm. to kids a, a unique opportunity, you know, a unique education experience for them. So, love to have the help, you know, let's convince the legislators yes, that, um, you know, what the future of education looks like. And I also think if, I'm sorry, if you That's look okay. from a standards perspective, you, you mentioned that we keep adding on. You have mm -hmm. to know this and you have to be able to do this and there's another course. I also think that will change. And the, the Jenga puzzle, what needs to come out and what needs to come in, mm -hmm. I think that will start to happen yeah. within a five year time frame. Yeah, I and I think we're coming from the opposite direction because as Dominic's saying, we don't have grades and we too are in grade bands, we don't have letter grades until our students leave. And then when our students yeah. leave, we you know, have to come up with a transcript. And that transcript has to translate to a different environment. And grades are a proxy that serve as a unit of communication. And so we 
we can be helpful in that conversation instead of <coughs> starting with the grade and backtracking of what's purposeful about learning, of starting what's purposeful about learning, how do you represent it, how do you translate it, and then how do you communicate it across multiple environments. Mm -hmm. And so I do think we are positioned to begin to lead that conversation more deeply. I like your Jenga image of that, you know, like in California, A to G courses, SAT, you put all those buckets in. <laughs> if we assume that we still need to teach every kid everything that we've always taught them, right. at best we can get a 10 or 15% efficiency play and right. we'll add in something cool. Right. I, for my children, am willing to pull out some big buckets. Yeah. I'm willing to have them maybe be a little light in this yeah. subject because they got fiery and passionate about that one. But here's my question. The more academically underprepared a kid is, the less they have parents like you all at home guiding them, the riskier this is and the harder it is to pull off. So what do you all think about this in the hardest to serve communities, the lowest income communities? How is it working? Do you have optimism? Or could this unintentionally exacerbate the achievement mm -hmm. gap? So I would like to just speak from experience. Um, I started, a, I had the great privilege of starting a system of schools out of a Supreme Court case, Chef versus O'Neill, which is a modern day Brown versus Board in Hartford. Mm -hmm. Connecticut, the second poorest city in America of its size. And we started with this premise. Everything that we're talking about here is what we did. Um, those were some of the poorest, uh, most disenfranchised learners in America. And we looked at grade bands. We looked at the opportunity to, the opportunity to use inquiry across the curricula, magnet schools, theme-based schools to get students involved and engaged and passionate about what they were interested in. And one of the schools was in the top 10, 100,000 schools in America, 75% ch children of color, 80% um, students of poverty. And we were not, we complied with tests. We had to take, it was the CMT and then S, S back or, but it was about teaching and ensuring that you were planned and you were purposeful in your learning and you were building good citizens and you were teaching multiple perspectives and how to look at the world differently. So I believe that if you do it right, you can operate effectively in the current construct. It's harder, it's less efficient, but you can do it because you're teaching students to think and to think differently and apply their learning. So I, I feel like so many times we go into urban areas with our most disenfranchised learners and think, oh well, you can't read, so let's make sure we give you X amount of phonics and you're gonna get pulled out for more phonics. And, and I think it's gifted strategies for everyone. And, and that is a, that's a big piece of my heart that you just touched on. Because I think we save the best learning for the affluent and this, the most in the box scripted learning for the ones who need the most innovation. Other thoughts on the achievement gap question? Yeah, I was working in inner city school district as well. And I think it's sometimes it's so simple, right? But sometimes it's not, it's very complex. But I think it comes always down to what I must say, like ownership and relationship. It's like how is a teacher building relationship with mm -hmm. the students, how you do your one-on-one -on -one conversation in the learning kind of like context where they're in. So when I was teaching there, I was really focusing on that relationship piece with my students and that really helped them because they didn't get the support from home and I even had to drag the, the, the parents to the school, right? So and it was all about the relation that I had with the students in that particular thing and I think that's what we need to focus on regardless of all the regulation into it. So and that's also what we do in a call up school with the graduation requirement of independence as a second layer but also character strengths and cognitive skills which are going to be fostered in those relationships. So we need role model, we need teacher training for, for these kind of things. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with either of you. I think um, kids need a lot of support. They need, you know, wraparound services. I think we found for those kids, um, we have something we call family academic support teams. But what is it that's getting in the way of a kid's learning? And is it that they were a teenage mom? Are they homeless right now? Do they not know where their next meal is going to come from? Um, you yes. can imagine, is, is, is mom at home during the day but not present enough to be a, a good learning coach? Um, and, and how do we solve that family's problem? How do we help solve that family's problem so that that child can learn? And I, and I agree, every child can learn. We should have high expectations. We can infuse the social, emotional, 
in the subject matter. You know, it does get complicated when you take an, a new ninth grader who maybe is reading at a fourth or fifth grade level. And then you've got a lot of work to do in four years. And maybe your goal for that child looks different than a goal, you know, the goals for a child that you maybe get a little bit earlier in the system. But largely, I think it's personal touches. Kids need to know that somebody cares about them and cares right. about their future. It's interesting, at least three and maybe all four of you um, work for organizations founded by big personalities <laughs> who are very like high profile in their own way. What have been the advantages that that's brought you and are there any like cons that you've noticed being the people who have to now implement some of that vision? <laughs> for me, there are no cons. Um, I think if you can dream it, you can articulate it, it will be funded and you can do it. And so working for GEMS Education, particularly the founder, Sonny Varkey, um, he doesn't sleep and we say he won't until every child in the world is given the opportunity that our children have. And so for that, the passionate drive behind who we are is, it's just a privilege to be here and, and to be able to, to contribute in this way. So no cons for us. Yeah, I, I would jump in on that as well. I, I think there's big personality, but I also think there's deep authenticity. Mm -hmm. And I think um, people come to this point in their life where they, they recognize, hey, I've done this, and now what can I give back? What can I really contribute? I, I have to go back to the last question as well, because what's interesting to me in hearing all of this is we've known these things for a while. I mean, I was doing portfolio with kids literally 25 years ago. And all of a sudden, we're talking about we need to do portfolios. This is a way to showcase learning when this is something we've been doing. We're almost in this Goldilocks moment where things are just right to act on what we've known for a long time, to act on what we know in terms of what's good for kids, to act on what we know in terms of the brain, to act on what we know in terms of what support educators need and how to accelerate that support. So, Yes, big personality. Yes, a moment in time where there are lots of things coming together that are actionable and a place in the space and the landscape with technology to be able to accelerate and amplify that. I think, and you need different types of people to yeah. make that happen. You need your big personalities and visionaries, and then you need your operators. And yeah. you know, I'm the operator. Our former founder and CEO was the visionary. And I will tell you, I mean, we had fights about what was possible. And I remember one real sort of turning point was over something he wanted me to do. And I was, I'm thinking like the operator, and I'm thinking, we, we can't, I, I don't know how we're gonna make this happen. And he looked at me and said, Allison, Allison, I know this is hard. <laughs> and I, I was like, this isn't hard, this is crazy. That's what I told him. And yet, I look back in that particular situation, it didn't get implemented exactly the way that we'd envisioned it, but gosh, having that person yeah, that's, that's willing true. to throw those things out that sound yeah. crazy, but really believes it can happen, gets the operators to go a little bit further than they would have gone. And what seemed completely crazy we managed to implement most of that within a couple years. Mm -hmm. So you need you need both. I think personally, I think uh, when I and Sal Khan met the first time, we shared our vision. So yeah, let's push the envelope further, like make it more accessible. And it was really reciprocal, the entire thing. And still now, where we have a, such a good relationship, so he chimes in on my pedagogical plans or our pedagogical plans. And he also attends sometimes now then the pedagogical leadership team. It's just a new thing will be added to it. So um, on, on the con side, it's probably more a political thing, right? So there's a lot of like um, people, philanthropic, um, um, people who want to give us money and decide for whom do we allow it to give us money, right? So because they have all personal agendas behind it. And, and so we have a lot of discussion about these things and, and we challenge each other. I think that's, that's really beneficial, beneficial to it, so. My guess is all of us spend a fair bit of time in the traditional school setting talking yeah. to people who think like something else isn't possible. Mm -hmm. So you spend a lot of your life as a zealot on the extreme of personalization, mm -hmm. new models. Um, and then you spend time at like, you know, Google or Facebook or even here, and you might have people saying, oh, it's just one algorithm away. We're going to solve the problem. <laughs> so what part of the it's one algorithm away do tech people not get? Why is this so much more complicated? Why has education been so immune to change? And I hope it is the Goldilocks moment, but I fear that we might be back here in 10 years saying, now we're in the Goldilocks moment. Yeah. It's a people business. Yes. And um, 
we talked about the relationships and the importance of place and society and service and creating global citizens. And when technology can do that, then perhaps we're one algorithm away. But right now it's that human interaction, that heart to heart, and that's, that's the problem. It's, it's not about what the data tells you because it's partly that. The data tells you this child, you can predict where the child's going to be in five years and the data is very helpful and the software tools and technology is helpful, but the child's going through a crisis in their lifetime and there's only a person on the other end, uh, the other end of a, a learning yes, coach a or chat, a right. video chat or a hand on a shoulder that says this is going to be okay and you're going to get through this and I care about you. And so for that, I don't know that an algorithm can, yeah. can take the place of, of a loving and caring individual mm -hmm. who tells yes. you you can do this. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and they don't scale necessarily. You know, you're going to need one of those for every X number of kids, no matter how many kids you have. But I think it can look different than what it looked like when we were kids and yeah. how it looks for our kids. And I think where, we some, where, where technology can help is kids today are so different than kids of mm -hmm. five years ago or 10 years ago. What they perceive as socialization doesn't necessarily mean sitting next to somebody in the same room, you know, but there has to be the somebody that cares about them. They need the interaction not only with other adults but with other students, but it can look vastly different, obviously, than it looks like in a brick and mortar today. Yeah, for me personally, it's also all about human touch. Initially, we had too much technology in, we paddled back. Uh, with that, we added more teachers to it. We have the same ratio as any other private school right now in terms of the student-teacher ratio. I think that's the key. It's all about human touch and building relationship. But the last point is also, I think we all have to, re uh, to really re relinquish control. I think that's the key thing as well. So, and sure, the tech gives us a lot of control, but we have also to trust because that builds confidence in a student, and then a student will disclose more and gets receiving, receiving and giving feedback in that regard. So. Yeah, I think what I would add, I'm, this is one of many reasons I love working at Alt School because it is the people from Google and the educators <laughs> together in the same place. Yes. And, um, and that's very rare. And, and here you have the people that are building the tools, experiencing firsthand the complexity of it, and the question becomes very different. The question doesn't become, you know, what's the next logarithm? The question becomes, what can we automate mm -hmm. so yes. greater access to kids mm -hmm. and engagement with kids is where you get to spend yeah. your mm -hmm. time? So we literally have our engineers just like sitting watching teachers grade. What are you doing now? How can I simplify that? How can I make that more efficient to free up your time to engage deeply with kids? Mm -hmm. So no panel ever covers everything we hoped to cover, but sometimes at the end of the panel, you say, I wish I had a chance to say this one idea. So tonight, while you're having a cocktail and you're watching <laughs> the Warriors sweep the jazz, who, what, what's the one idea, Bay Area, sorry. What's the, um, what's the one thing you wish we could have covered and now's your chance to sort of share a closing thought? You know, I, I think there's not going to be one solution that works for every single mm -hmm. kid. Mm -hmm. And part of solving the crisis of education in the country is figuring out what are the hundred different solutions and every iteration within so that we have a solution for every kind of kid that we're trying to serve. Um, I don't think, clearly every child is unique, but I think we can say they, there are similarities across. So what's going to be the solution for the high-functioning autistic kid that can maybe work for 70% of those kids? What's going to be the solution for the gifted and talented kid who really needs um, some different kind of, of pushing and enrichment? And, and we need to piece those together, and it's going to take thousands of solutions, not yeah. one solution. I'll, I'll jump in really quickly in the pause just because I'm watching the clock tick away. Oh, yeah. um, is how do we organize ourselves differently? I think, Dominic, you were getting at it in terms of the learner role is different, the educator role is different. How do we mobilize a community to serve as a teacher for all, and how do we position students um, differently in that, in that dialogue is something I would love to continue to explore. On the organizing piece, so many, there are so many parallel mo models that are happening in parallel that are really gaining steam and are showing their level of effectiveness. How do we continue to organize ourselves to continue to have these conversations yes. so that we grow and we learn from one another and we're able to amplify and scale? Mm -hmm. And I think that 
so much of what's happening is happening in isolation, and we need to build an ecosystem to create one conversation. Yeah, that's exactly also what I was thinking. It's just not one stand. It cannot be one stand. It's all different contexts. But what it's missing at the moment is collaboration between the different contexts. And that's what we need to focus on, using all the synergies amongst all these different contexts and then connecting it to concepts. And that, that's what it's needed. Yeah. So you think about it, if you take all the aspects of what you heard, like I would want my child in this school. <laughs> <laughs> and now how do we do that? At so scale? let's make it happen. Let's make it yeah. happen. I mean, I'm left thinking about, um, Colleen, your point of people sitting side by side. Like I do think we have to listen to the technologists. I do think we have to listen to the futurists. And I hope people will also listen to the educators. Right. And I've said for a long time, anyone who says, oh, this will be easy, just walk away from them. <laughs> and anyone who says this is impossible, run away from them. <laughs> exactly. So join me in thanking our panelists, you guys. Thank you.